Hi folks, my name's Robert Earl. I live out here in far west Texas in a little ranch we call the Eco Ranch. And I do a number of videos about my Eco Ranch. That's not what this video is about today. But I'm going to tell you a few things today. And first of all, you need to know, I am not ex-military, I'm not ex-CIA, I'm not ex-law enforcement, I'm not, I wasn't a Navy SEAL or a Green Beret. In fact, all I am is a retired truck driver and that's all I've been my whole life. I'm a normal American. I'm Joe Lunchbox, like maybe you are. However, we had somebody in Texas a long time ago that, that, that had a saying and I'm going to tell you this saying because I feel just like he did way back in the 70s. I am mad as hell and I'm not going to take it anymore and you shouldn't either. What am I mad about? Well, a little over a week ago in Orlando, Florida, a place I've been many times, there was a mass shooting. We all know about it. It was in the Pulse nightclub where one man walked into a building with a couple hundred people in it and managed to shoot 103 of those people. I'm mad as hell and I'm not going to take it anymore. And so are all of you. But what's being done about it right now? Well, let's see. We had 15 hours of a filibuster from one side of the aisle. That got four votes on gun control. Let's take the guns away from them. Well, that failed from the other side of the aisle. So what do we have? We have nothing except moments of silence and, and, and people that promise to remember. Well, I'll tell you what. I had to hear the name Sandy Hook to remember that there were a number of children killed there at Sandy Hook. We put those things right out of our mind until the next time and the next time and the next time and it's got to stop. So I'm mad as hell and I'm not going to take it anymore. Now I am 63 years old. I'm not a great big old huge guy. I'm not somebody that, that's a big old macho man. I'm just like the rest of you. But I'm going to go over some things today and I'm going to show you and tell you a way that we can protect ourselves. Now, as I tell you these things, I have notes here to help me stay brief because I tend to ramble and anyone that's seen any of my videos will know that I tend to ramble. So I've got the notes here and you're going to see my eyes drop down some. Then I'm going to demonstrate a few things to you. But please, although this is not very professional, I dress this way for a reason. I do have other clothes, but I dress this way for a reason. I'm, I'm not selling you my clothes. I'm selling you the concept, only I'm not selling anything. This concept is free and it's something we all need to do. What we're going to talk about today is proactive self-preservation. Not by carrying a gun or by gun control. Congress has already shown us that that discussion will continue and continue and will go nowhere. This discussion today is about acting, reacting, and using what is around us, including us as a weapon to protect ourselves against a crazy or a terrorist or a religious whack job with a gun intent on shooting the hell out of us anyway. Now no elected official can oppose this because the only lobby that could possibly in the, our government oppose active reaction, proactive reaction would be the terrorist lobby themselves. And last I saw, they didn't have one. You know, we are the greatest civilization that this planet has ever seen to date. We've proven we can do anything. We transplant organs. We sent men to the moon. We just sent a craft to Pluto, the furthest object that, that we named in the solar system. We have to be the greatest civilization in order to, come, to do all those things. Now, if we can do those things, and let's not even forget the fact that in a matter of months during World War II, we went from isolationism to full militarization, and we won World War II on two fronts. If we can do that, we certainly can come up with a way of solving the problems that are facing our nation today when it comes to mass shootings. Think about that. Why can't we do it? Why can't we come up with a solution that, that suits all of us? Well, we can. We can effectively deal with mass shootings in a way that, that 
will agree with all sides of a political argument. Look, you think in 1955, less than 10 years after we won World War II, and gosh, five years after Korea was, it had ended, do you think that a wacko with a machine gun would have been able to walk into a bar and start shooting at people when there were a whole hell of a lot of young, healthy combat veterans in there? No, he would have been mobbed and overwhelmed and, and, and probably killed on the spot. Why? Because they knew how to react. They knew how to react because if they didn't know how to react, they wouldn't have come back from those wars. You think somebody would have, you think four guys with box cutters in 1955 would have been able to hijack a plane and crash it into a building? Hell no. Even if there were only four veterans on that plane, they would have rushed them and then everybody else would have gotten a message and said, oh, there's more of us than him. These, this is a type of thinking that's gone by the wayside. As the greatest generation has died, we've forgotten it. And this is the way of the world. It isn't an indictment against our people by any means. And nothing I'm saying is an indictment against us. We don't know and we can't be faulted for what we don't know. And let's not forget when we're talking about that, those two GIs in France that on a subway, I think it was a subway, but on a train, attacked and disarmed a guy that had guns all over the place. Now one of them got shot, I think there were three guys. One of them got shot, but they disarmed him. How many lives did they save? This is what I'm getting at. And this is what I'm going to demonstrate to you, ask you, not somebody else, you, to teach, learn, and demand is taught to all of our children, to our wives, our husbands, and our community. I'm going to ask you to get out to your elected officials and ask that we get working on learning what I'm about to show you. And it's going to be rudimentary because I'm no cinematographer. I have more things to do than sit here and practice so that you can go, wow, he does great YouTube videos. But the concept, what I'm going to show you is priceless. Proactive self-preservation is what I'm showing you. Now, that doesn't quite roll off the tongue well, so at the end of this, I have a name for it that I think we can all rally around. So here's what little background I have on what I'm about to show you. I had many who tried to teach me different aspects of of, of self-preservation and self-defense from an ROTC instructor in 1967 to a guy named Jimmy the Grip that was with the Detroit mob. It's simple, it's effective, and if you turn on, gosh, if you turn on any Western, especially the old Westerns like Lash LaRue, uh, Charles Starrett, um, Roy Rogers, I'm watching Roy Rogers now for no particular reason. You'll see that they use these same techniques in the, in the old westerns. Let me show you. So here I am sitting in the bar. Now I'm going to be sitting in the bar for these demonstrations because that's probably one of the worst possible things you could be doing is sitting down. Because in order to do anything you got to stand up. But I'm sitting at the bar and I have a bunch of stuff around me, including the notes that I still have to keep looking at. And the guy's going to walk in. Here's what's going to happen. The guy's going to walk in. Now, I have nobody to help me, so I'm going to do, do this. The guy's walking in the bar. There's three seconds. There's two. There's one. There's zero. Ah, now, the guy's pulling his gun, and he's starting whatever kind of rhetoric he's got, whether it be Allah Akbar or freeze you sons of bitches. Whatever it is, we're going to do three, two, one. When I do this, I'm seeing the gun, and I want you to watch what I do and what happens. And I'm going to remind you of something after I do this first little demonstration here. This first little demonstration is just to show you what it's possible that we can do if we... Gun! 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 Rush him! Rush him! Now you're going to notice some editing cuts because I'm fighting with gusts of wind coming in and I don't want the wind to mask me since I'm a distance from you. But what did you see there? You saw my shoe come off. I kicked my shoe in his direction. I probably could have hit him, but him was you and I'm not going to break my camera. The thing is, it takes me a minute, a, a second or so to respond, but it also takes him a second to respond. In fact, studies have shown now, you macho men out there are going to say, well, not me, that doesn't apply to me. Okay, but for us mere mortals, for us mere mortals, which I guarantee you that the wacko that's going to come in and try to shoot up a, a schoolyard full of children or a bunch of people in a bar, 
He's mortal. It takes a full second for his eyes to tell his brain that I'm reacting to what he's doing and to finish pulling the trigger. So from the time that I began to kick that shoe off, he had to identify it. From the moment he begins to identify it, it's a full second. One second. In nine tenths of a second, you can cover a lot of ground. And in nine tenths of a second, even if I don't cover ground, if I say I'm going to sacrifice myself, in nine tenths of a second, I can get my 200 pound body up and moving in this direction. And even if it's a kill shot right between the eyes, he's got 200 pounds that's going to hit him. Yeah, I'm dead and nobody wants to die, me least of all. But if I don't do this, and if I don't take a chance, how many might die? Two, 20, 49? Think about that. Now let's go to the next scenario. So let's say you can't get your shoes off or it's just inconvenient or you're afraid you'll kick it straight up in the air and actually he'll watch that. So you're buying yourself more than a second. But we're sitting here and we're doing our little thing and we're doing our thing here and all of a sudden in comes the problem. He's got a gun, everybody! He's got a gun! Rush him! Rush him! What about that? We all have smartphones. Now the point is, this is the cell phones, smartphones. They're heavy, they're lighted, they're brightly colored nowadays. Everybody's got their whatever on them. They're brightly colored. They're tremendously distracting. You throw them, and especially if 20 of them come at him, can you imagine what would happen? Can you even begin to imagine what would happen if all of a sudden somebody pulls, comes into a bar full of people and takes and starts to, and pulls out a gun and is going to start shooting people if all of a sudden 200 beer bottles or beer cans or whiskey glasses come charging at him. How distracting would that have been? Not to mention the two that becomes 20, that becomes 50, that rip his arms off and beat him to death with them. Now you've got another scenario, of course, that can always happen, and that scenario uh, is something else. Now I happen to be sitting here in a very heavy chair, but if I didn't have a heavy chair, let's say I was sitting in another gun, everybody get him! Got you, didn't I? Now, how do you think Mr. Manteen or Mateen or whatever the heck his name was would have responded to that? Think about that. Now, I think you're starting to get the idea. Jackets, purses, a pile of clothing, hats. One of the things I was going to do was something very simple and throw this magazine at you. But if you throw a magazine in the air or a book, this one was too thick. That's why I didn't throw it. It'll spread out like this, like that. That's distracting. Anything that's distracting, anything that can throw an aim off, that's your object. And here's another thing I was taught, and this is something you have to realize, and I'm sure that there's 49 people that would tell you this if they were able right now. Once you see a gun in someone's hand, in a public place, you have to assume that you're dead. Once you've seen the gun, you're dead. It's up to you, you, not the government, you, to reclaim your life. It's that simple. You are dead. That man pulled that gun out for no other reason than to kill you or somebody. You have to assume it's you. You have to assume when you see it, you're dead and you have to take your life back. I will take my life back by whatever means possible. And if I have to throw a bowl of popcorn at him, I'll throw a bowl of popcorn at him. I will throw my dog at him. I'll throw anything at him. Anything is a weapon and your body is a weapon. If you get that body, no matter what, where the shot hits you, that body is going to keep going and fall. And the odds of a kill shot are actually fairly slim. And other people will be moving at the same time. Now then, the best time for action 
is the moment, the instant that a threat is realized. That is your best window for action, for proactivity. The assailant is concerned. He's pulled the gun out. Now he's concerned because you're not contained. He doesn't know his surroundings yet because you haven't responded to him. And he's got adrenaline going. And, and there are times when you get adrenaline going and you try to do something that you don't quite do it right because that adrenaline, you're not normal. You're all of a sudden smarter and stronger and faster. He's got that same adrenaline going. And so he can aim that gun at you and it's entirely possible that he could miss anyway. That will, that adrenaline, that rush that he's got at that moment can affect his aim just on its own, let alone you throw in a shoe or your uh, baby stroller, preferably without the baby in it, or a magazine or something. That will distract him. And while he is in that state of heightened adrenaline and slight confusion because he doesn't have you contained, you can, there's still time for you to act unpredictably. And the thing that he's not predicting you to do is to start throwing shit and charging him. He's predicting you to fall to your knees and cower because what do Americans do? It's called learned helplessness. We fall to our knees. We wait for the government or the police to come and help us while he walks around behind us one by one and shoots us in the back of the head. Now, I don't know about you, but I would rather be dead from six bullets in the chest from moving in that direction to try to do something to him than on my knees cowering in fear with a bullet in the back of my head. You are dead. Take your life back. Now you have to remember, he's scared too. Besides, gunshots aren't like they are in Hollywood when one shot drops somebody quietly. It, it takes several. And the odds of a mortal wound are low. Now, yeah, mortal wounds happen. I mean, I was once out with a guy who took a pot shot with a 22 at a, at a 500 pound black bear sitting about a quarter mile away and he hit her right in the heart and killed her. But it's really kind of rare. It's kind of hard to do a kill shot on somebody. And nowadays we can repair a liver. We can, we, can, we can repair a hole in the lung. There's a lot that the doctors can do nowadays. The odds of a mortal wound are low, but the odds of death from, from a bullet in the brain while you're on your knees, that's pretty high. You know, in World War I, Baron von Richthofen, the Red Baron, was flying low because those planes flew low in those days and, and a, British, um, a British soldier with a 303 rifle, an Enfield 303, fired at him and shot him right in the heart. Baron von Richthofen, with a hole in his heart, landed his airplane and still had time to speak to the soldiers before he died. Now, if a crazy gets a shot off and hits me in the heart and I've got that much time, I'm going to chew his head off. Now, regarding carrying a gun for protection, now I never carried one, and I never carried one not because I'm anti-guns, because I own several guns. I had an instructor, another instructor, I had a lot of them. But I said, but this is true. These are not made-up stories. This instructor taught me, oh, I, I, over 45 years ago, that when you carry a weapon, you become dependent on that weapon, psychologically. Now again, the macho men out there are saying, oh, I took Krav Maga classes, and yes, you're the toughest white boy in your survival group, and I'm talking about us mortals now. You become dependent on a weapon psychologically, and if it's taken away from you, or it's locked in a glove box, you are effectively defenseless. No matter what other training you have, your main defense is gone. Now I'm sure that a couple of these badass guys that are out there saying, I can kick anybody's butt, they were there inside a pulse. And maybe they acted. But two people acting alone against an armed man is not going to work. It's got to be done in unison. We have to do it together. They needed the help from others to act, react, and improvise weaponry. Reacting cannot be a one-man show. It's got to become the American response, because guess what? It's the Israeli response. Let's make it the American response so that we don't have another Pulse nightclub. We don't have another San Bernardino. 
Sandy Hook gets a little bit rough, but I'll bet you those six and seven year olds could have thrown a whole bunch of shit and, you know, maybe, just maybe something could have been done. And I'd rather have a maybe than a no way. Defending yourself from a shooter transcends borders. We have solidarity, solidarity with the Israelis, the British, the Belgians, the French, and all peace-loving peoples of the world. Je suis Charlie applied in France, but it also applied in Orlando a couple weeks ago. Once potential shooters know this, that we are all one, we are unified, and we're going to use the American, or the Israeli, or the French, or the Australian, or the Nigerian response, how many of them are going to chance a mass killing if they know we're going to beat them to death? Or at least sit on them until the police come. Now finally, I don't know how long this is, but finally, this is the end, folks. Self-preservation training, as a title, doesn't have a catchy ring to it. So I kind of liked what Todd Beamer said on Flight 93 on September 11th of 2001, he simply said, let's roll. Why not honor him and those who helped him because he didn't do it alone, but it got done. So why not honor them by calling it either the Beamer defense or the let's roll defense? This isn't about me. It's an idea that I have, and it's an idea that I'm telling you about. I don't want you to remember me. Remember Todd Beamer, and let's roll. Remember what I'm showing you, and remember that you have learned helplessness. You, your children, all of us, almost all of us, have learned helplessness. We have to be trained. We have to go to courses, and we have to go to quarterly refresher courses to teach us to be proactive, to act, react, and weaponize ourselves with whatever's around us. We have to have these courses. Now, it'd be great if communities would take this up and do it for free because people aren't going to want to pay. It would be better if all of those nattering fools on this side, the ones that talk for 15 hours and the one that just say no because he's talking, if all of those people would get together and say, well, you know what? Nobody's paying us to oppose this. No one's bribing us to oppose this. No one's donating um, money to us to oppose this. So therefore, we can go ahead and we can make it law. And we can make it law. Contact your elected officials and make it law that they teach us. They provide the Let's Roll defense training or the Beamer defense training or whatever we want to call it, but let's do it. And I don't mean tomorrow, and I don't mean next week, and I don't mean let's talk about it for three or four years, because people are still going to nightclubs, people are still going out in the evenings, people are still going to school, children are still going to school. We need it tomorrow. We need to start it right now. Get after your elected officials. Sit down with yourself and your family. This is training. You have to train to do this. Do it. Learn more about it. I'm sure better people than I will make videos. I just want to make one of the first to get everybody going. Let's do it. Get out there, folks. And I will see you, hopefully, all of us, safe and alive somewhere. Until then, this is Robert Earl out here in Terlingua, Texas. Bye for now.